Is SETI a scientific or a spiritual quest? It's both. It's fascinating to me that uh, there are people who are dedicating their careers to searching for extraterrestrial intelligence when there is not one iota of evidence that there's any life of any kind off the Earth. But it is a matter of faith. And the basic faith is it's an enormous universe, and you make the assumption of mediocrity that Earth is not a special place. It's just sort of an average place. Uh, as far as we know, you know, the sun is an average type of star. There are zillions like the sun all around the universe. So perhaps the Earth is not special, and the uh, evolution of life and intelligence even is not a special thing. However, we have looked at every planet in the solar system except Pluto. We have found no evidence for life at all. We have been listening with radio telescopes for decades now. And admittedly, uh, in a very primitive way, but no signals that you can interpret as intelligent. But people do have faith, and they continue the search, and I think it's a good thing to do. What are the odds that something's out there? Years ago, astronomer Frank Drake created the Drake Equation to calculate n, the number of intelligent civilizations in our galaxy. And n equals the number of new stars formed in the galaxy every year, times the fraction that have planets, times the fraction that can support life, times the percentage that develop life, times the fraction that become intelligent, times the percentage that can and want to communicate, times L, the lifetime of a technological civilization. And what exactly are the values for F and R and L? <coughs> Who knows? Astronomers inserted their best guesstimates and calculated N equals 10,000. 10,000 intelligent civilizations in our galaxy. So there's life. It's in space, but it never calls, it doesn't phone, it never writes. God forbid you couldn't drop us a note. Nancy, why do you think our radio dish antennas haven't picked up any alien signals? Sure, okay. The first contact collection includes a chapter called The Mystery of the Great Silence. Here, SF author David Brin outlines some of the excuses that contact optimists have invented for the failure of SETI to reach out and touch someone or something. Some of the explanations, well, some of the contact optimists, the mischosen praise in this respect, perhaps, say um, starships are impossible, even though it seems that they ought to work. Um, they say that one possibility is that you create an intelligent robot probes, which would go and report back for you, and then at the next star system, make 100 copies of themselves and send them on, and then each one at the, the new place sends up 100 copies and so on. You'd fill the galaxy with these probes. It's been calculated within 3 million years. I, I wrote a short story about this. But what if somebody were to do this with a, a nasty probe, one that was designed to tune in on broadcast emanations from, from a newly fledged life form and destroy it? Well, it's too, too late to call back the uh, words that we are speaking right now into the airwaves. Uh, that's a rather nasty scenario. And if that were so, the galaxy would stay filled with these terrible robots. Uh, and no one would have had a chance to get started enough to be able to defeat them. That could explain the silence that we hear. For stories about these kind of intergalactic smart weapons, check out the Berserker books by Fred Saberhagen. They're about an endless war against giant robotic planet killers. But even if we do make contact and they're friendly, there still are dangers. David Brin explored the more subtle risks of first contact in an article for Aboriginal SF. And then one of my earthbound friends in control got David's editor to summarize the article. While supporting the fact that we should indeed try to communicate with the life forms that in all probability do exist out there, uh, we have to be prepared to possibly suffer the same fate the American Indian faced, in that if we meet a culture that is significantly advanced beyond ours, but not so significantly advanced that we're not, we're beneath them. In other words, if it's a culture that finds reason to come in contact with us, we are likely to become submerged in that culture and lose our own identity, uh, whether that's by physical conquest or whether it's just by uh, a sense of, uh, a devalued sense of self-worth, in that Suppose they bring us uh, immortality. How are we going to handle immortality in our present society? We can't 
we can't even handle our normal lifespans. If you look at China and you look at India, you have runaway populations that are using up uh, resources beyond the capacity of the, of the people to live. And uh, this kind of advanced science being brought to us suddenly, without our own effort, without our ability to gradually adapt to it, could be devastating. It, it, could, it could destroy humanity's culture. And, and this is one of the, the real serious potential problems of the first contact, assuming there is that difference. On the other hand, there's the, the, less, the more benign possibility that we'll meet a culture somewhat beneath us in terms of the scientific evolution, or not evolution, but uh, achievement. And then we have the same danger of us doing to them what we've already done in the past. Uh, the human race does not have a good track record of advanced cultures intermingling with less advanced cultures. We tend to go in and uh, use strip mining methods, not just on their resources, but on their society as well. Larry, in your novels Footfall and The Molten God's Eye, the first contact is harmful to humans. What do you think is the biggest threat of real first contact? Like this, N not, the, not the Martian threat. We are certainly inedible to something that evolved on another world. Uh, the proteins are, are very likely to be wrong. Uh, our way for colonizing another planet is probably to, to destroy the ecology uh, locally and then move our ecology in. Uh, the threat is likely to be... Let me lay out a threat for you. The universe, I'm told, is 20 billion years old. The solar system is 5 billion years old. It could be we are the first intelligent species in the universe. It, it sounds totally implausible, but it, it's starting to look less implausible. But if we're not the first, then the first might be a billion years older than us. In these past million years of, of being intelligent, we've gone from nothing, nothing, well, from fire, say, or, or chipped flint axes, to a space program. Where will we be in a billion years? Possibly gone, probably gone. Species don't last a billion years. Uh, the time of the dinosaurs didn't include any one dinosaur for any of that time, for, for, for that full length. But if we met something a billion years old, uh, they would be advanced beyond our goals. We would probably have nothing to say to them. That's the danger. The biggest problem with first contact is how do we make ourselves understood to somebody who doesn't share any reference points in common with us? And how do they make themselves understood to us? The classic story of that in science fiction is Stanley G. Weinbaum's A Martian Odyssey, where the uh, poor character Jarvis from Earth meets up with Tweel, a Martian, who he ends up calling Tweel because Tweel won't stop changing his name long enough for him to remember what his name is from minute to minute, his own personal name changes. The, com the common points between us and, and anything we might come in first contact with are going to be so hard to find that it may in fact be impossible. A great example of that is there seems to be a lot of evidence that dolphins and other cetaceans have highly developed brains. And we see evidence in whale songs and dolphin uh, songs that they actually have elaborate patterns of communication that might legitimately be called language. And yet we can't talk to them. No matter how much we try, we can't seem to find anything in common to talk about. We, they sing at us and we talk to them, but there's no contact. We're right there adjacent with the dolphin and yet first contact hasn't occurred yet. The big question is whether it's even possible for something with an alien mind to communicate with something with a human mind. It may be that first contact, even if you can get them side by side, sitting in chairs side by side, that first contact may be an elusive thing. You may never have real communication.